In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Though our sins are scarlet, you've made us white as snow. Though our sins are scarlet, you've made us white as snow. him and he wants to know you will you pray that right now that God will open our understanding our minds our thoughts and our thoughts and our head that we can receive this word today in Jesus name thank you Jesus Lord you can help us now we need your spirit we need your presence we need the touch of God I honor you today Jesus you are my God. You are my deliverer, my healer, my salvation. Without you, we can do nothing. We need you, Jesus. We can't even walk without you holding our hand. We walk with you. We talk with you. We live with you. We fellowship with you. I love you for it, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. In Exodus 25 and 8, the Lord said to Moses, he said, have the people to build me a sanctuary so I may dwell among them, among them. And when you realize what they had, it is wonderful in a sense, but they looked toward the tabernacle and they saw the glory and, and all that was on that, but you're in your tent. Now, God wanted to get a little closer than just being among you. He can be among us and you don't even get any of it. But he worked a plan whereby he purchased a church and he said, now I'm going to be in you, not just among you, but in you if you have the word of God in you you have the spirit of God in you when I leave that door I'm not leaving Jesus here I'm not leaving the presence of God with me with you no I could go down the highway and I can still call on the living God worship him in my soul in my spirit in my thoughts in my heart you must learn to continually be in touch with the Holy Ghost because it's not made just for performances it's not made to you, they see you on the street corners. You pray that way like the Pharisees. No, sir, I tell you what. When Jesus got a few disciples together, he changed whole, their whole way of life. Now, we say prayer changes things. But let me tell you what. You can pray and do all of those things. But if you don't take and obey the word, and I found out my early beginnings, they told me to, if you had a problem, go pray. Well, praying is me talking to God. I need him to talk to me. And believe me, when you're praying, God's just listening. But if you ever get to the place that you can feel him in your spirit and you can worship him and magnify him in your heart and life, you'll carry his presence with you all the way. You don't have to wait to pray at church or pray two hours a day. No, sir, you keep your spirit, your spirit in touch with the Holy Ghost all day long. You have it in your heart, have it in your mind. There's got to be something in us beyond just church services. We've got to carry the Spirit of the Lord in our earthly sanctuary. My body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. That means Jesus lives in my body. He lives in my soul, in my life. Daniel waited 21 days and 
before he got his answer, but I tell you what, he's right here. He's not up there. He's inside of my heart. I can pray to that God. He can hear and answer me where and ever, wherever I'm at. What I like about it, it, I don't have to know how to explain it. I tried to at times and say, God, I don't know what to tell you I need, but you know what I need. I'm praying for you to put it in my heart, into my soul. I've got some young people that are, that catches on to it. But what they don't realize, if you don't fight to keep it, you'll lose it. You did run well, but what has hindered you? And I, over the years, I was converted in a, in a revival, and that's all we had was revival. We didn't have no pastor. But I wanted to find out how in the world God wants me to live and, and walk. And I found out that if I take the word of God and begin to do what the word says, then prayer can help me. But if you don't do what God tells you to do in the word, you're wasting your time. Now, what I'm going to go to is tell you this. And I don't know, I haven't preached on this thought long enough, but you can't even talk to God unless you're humble. Humility is the only, go only gate that goes into heaven. Now, when Jesus was here in Matthew 11, he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And he introduced himself as, I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. I read that and walked over it, didn't pay much attention to it. But brother, I come back to realize my God is the only one that's humble. He's got to give me his humility for me to have it. I wasn't born with it. And sometimes we think that's probably a weakling in a sense. But the humble shall eat the good of the land. Humility is a part of living for God. If you don't develop your character, you can't be a Christian. I could be a good preacher and a poor husband. I could be a good preacher and do all these things for you and you'd be blessed with it but I could, I'd be a poor rep representative of Jesus Christ I got to the place dear God I want to know how you want me to do it I'm going to do it because you want me to do it I'm not leaning on the others back me up I want to trust in the living God I want to hear your voice and do your will and I've had a good time doing it I'm more happy living for God today than every time in my life the past is gone but I thank God for the present I live knowing the God that I serve he lives inside of my heart and I walk with him and talk with him all day long amen praise him again now I've learned that if I go to the word I can find out how he wants me to come to church. And I like to read it to you. It's a hundred psalm. It says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Now that's why we have singing in the church first. We come before his presence with singing. This scripture let you see that God wants us to have a joyful, not sad countenance, but a joyful experience inside of our heart. And young people traveling through those teenage years, they're rough, I know it. I wouldn't go back for nothing, but I tell you what, if you know Jesus Christ, you're not alone. He'll help you to develop your personality, develop your good manners, and develop what I call Christian character. I'm more convinced today, if you don't have good character, you're not a good preacher. If you can't handle money, you shouldn't be in the ministry. If you can't do the thing that God wants you to do and serve him with all your heart and not let others interfere with you, you don't belong here. God's got to save us individually. We'll all go up together, but not individually. So I'm asking God to put something in our church that makes us so hungry and thirsty for God that we'll walk out of this dark hour and lift up our name, his name in the believe that this is the day that he gave us and we're going to worship and be joyful in it. Now look at this scripture. I want you to look at the thoughts that's in it. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us 
and not we ourselves. We are, the, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Now here's how you come. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. That means when you come in the door to get into the building, that's a gate. You come in being thankful, appreciative, thanking God for the word, thanking God for the pastor, thanking God for the friends you got in church, being thankful. He said, you come in that foyer thanking God another day. But when you come a little closer, he said, uh, enter into his courts with praise be thankful unto him and bless his name now the, when you come into his house here this is court and a judge controls this court he's the boss he said no chewing gum in this courtroom and if you're chewing and you won't spit it out the bailiff will come down and escort you out. Brother Clayton, one of our ministers was in there one time, he forgot he had his hat on. He hit that thing and said, no hat, take off hats in this house, in this room. He didn't even hear, he didn't know what he was talking about. He said it two or three times and finally it dawned on him he had a hat on. Boy, he yanked that hat off in a minute. There's rules to the house. There's rules to the house. And you have to obey the rules of the house. You say, well, show it to me in the scripture. First of all, we're not joining you. You're joining us. And we made the rules before you got here. We don't intend to change the rule when you get here. That's the rules of the house. Then God's got rules of living. And you live by those rules. When we come to church, we come to hear his judgments on what he wants us to do, judging things. If I learn that if I abide by his decisions, I won't be judged. But you come in the house of God to be taught how to live and the way to live. Someone said, well, when you're preaching on some of these things, you was preaching at me today. I said, I sure was. I was trying to hit you as hard as I could. And, and you may take the attitude, well, I don't like some. Let me tell you what, I'm going to stir up your nature and find out what kind of nature you've got. Your nature won't go to heaven. I'm more troubled with carnal people than I am spiritual people. It's hard pastoring a carnal church. And we got into the, this thing these last days. We got more affluency than ever before. We got more money and everything else. But it's about time we get more of Jesus working in our lives. More of the Spirit of God working inside. We need the Holy Ghost to help us. You've got to fall in love with Jesus. Reach out after him. Let your heart feel after him and reach after him. I look and see that he gave the, the order of it. And then he said, be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, his truth endureth to all generations. Now that's the way the church should be conducted. There's something about the church that's special. You can pray at home, pray by yourself, but God knew you'd need the body together. You can't do it all at home, and you can't do it all here. But what I'm trying to get across to you, you and Jesus Christ can make a connection. You can walk with him and talk with him after you leave this church. Feel his spirit, feel his presence. You've got to have a hunger enough in your heart when the words preach, you'll say amen to it. We had a Russian lady that just come in our church four years ago, I guess. And she come to me wondering, talking about cutting her hair. She didn't know anything about that too much. But well, anyhow, she said, well, I, I just trim it and said, is that all right? I said, well, the Bible said not to cut it. She said, well, I'll repent of that. No argument left. I've talked to some people. They'll fuss and argue back for an hour. I ain't going to fuss with them. This is it. If you don't like it, you know what you can do. No need of worrying your brain over people that won't measure up the rules of the word. 
then the rules of the house is just as important that you obey those rules because we want to have church in a decently orderly manner and we're going to let you run it. Young people, you've got to get this in your youth. It'd be easier to live for God if you bear the yoke in your youth because as life goes on, you'll develop something inside of you. Not only that, you'll have a character that nobody can break. I, I see more of that, and I'm sorry to say even sometime in the church, that's, there's not good character. We think if we feel good in church, that's, that's good enough. But I want you to know you need to pay the man off that you borrowed money from. <laughs> you need to do the things that God asks you to do. You need to repent when you say something you shouldn't have said. If you've done something that needs to be corrected, go out there and let that man know, I'm sorry. I was not in the spirit, I was in the flesh. There was two fellows got into a heated argument. One of them said, the devil in me and the devil in you. I said, that's what's causing our problem. No, it's your carnal nature in both of you. When you get to fussing with each other, you're carnal. Well, I'm kind of weighing what I say because you don't know me. Well, yeah. I don't like Brother Goder. I'll be leaving in the morning too. But I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of you. I'm telling you, I got a God that I will honor and respect above you and everybody else. This idea we've got to cooperate with things. You cooperate with the man of God. You have to realize that you have to close the gate to your mind to people that tell you things that you don't need to know. This is the rule that goes with that. If you're not part of the problem or part of the solution, don't hear it. The moment you hear it, you judge it right there. And God said, I'm going to judge you according to the way you judge that. He said, well, if that was my kid, I'd do so-and-so. God said, I'll give you a kid just like him. <laughs> and you'll get, you'll get your belly full of before it's too long. You have to understand, God does not argue with you. When he says something, it's not a matter of negotiation. And you may come to the pastor for something and want to negotiate it. But I'm telling you what. He'll get in trouble with God. He may lose you and 10 more. But I don't want to be in trouble with God because I want to go to heaven. I want to make it through the pearly gates. We don't need to let the devil cheat us out of being a blessing to the church and others. As young people, you can develop a testimony. You can develop a Christian walk and character inside of you. I want us to help these young people that didn't go out in the world. They're more of more of a testimony that they didn't go out in the world than those that come back in. We put them up here and make almost an idol out of them. No, I don't want to hear your rotten junk that you went through when you were a sinner. Don't tell the people that. Tell me about Jesus that delivers you, sets you free. Tell me about the power of God that works in your life. Let me see it. Let me hear it. We need to learn of it. You have to have a humble attitude to be submissive. Now, I, I think you can handle this. I'm going to try it and see. Do you realize when you married your wife and you married your husband, he said you love them? Now, I know it gets still, and I know I'm talking to you. God... You don't know how hard it is to live with this man. He'll say, well, I didn't choose him. That was your choice. And you can complain if you want, but you should love him anyhow. I use this thought on that. This. You can say, well, she's a poor housekeeper. When you come home from work, she may have to give you a road map to walk in the house. But you still love her. And that's no excuse. I'm saying when you obey the word of God, 
when you show love to your husband, he'll begin to change. Men are not complicated. No, they're not. When a wife shows her love and appreciation, support, he'll do anything for you. But if you nag and complain, as soon as he opens the door, you tell him all the bad things that happened all day. He hadn't got a chance to sit down in the house yet. I'm telling you, you're on rocky grounds with your marriage. <laughs> now, what I'm trying to get across to you, you do what the Bible said to do regardless of how you feel about it and the way you think about it. Go ahead and do it the way you want to do it to please him. Amen. Some men never tell their wives, I love you. Yeah, I know. Well, she knows I love her. Well, who wants to hear somebody that knows in their thoughts, okay? But I don't like that. I like to hear somebody, I love you. Now, Jesus said it over and over again. He loved us. Why don't we show our loved one to the other as he showed his? Sister Freeman made a statement some years ago, and I felt like that. This is really what I'm trying to accomplish. I hope I can get my points together like you can see it. She said she asked the Lord if we're at the end times, what, what is it that the church may need today? And he said, well, my people worship exuberantly. You know, he commends us for that. Because it's good to see you worship. You've got good worship here. You've got some good young people too, man. They worship God. You're blessed. Make it easier on you. It's just the ones that don't do it that makes it worse. But you young people, get right in here with your heart and soul. You're right up to in the front. I appreciate that. You're doing good. And the next thing, he said, there's two things he felt like we needed more than anything else. He said, my people are lacking in the love that I have, that I love you like. No, that's not the, how you put that. In other words, he wants you to love like he loves. Like he's loved you, he wants you to love me. Others, they're lacking in love. And if you read the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, you'll find out what that is. But I'm telling you, friend, this is a church that believes that God is filling us and blessing us and keeping us. But we can get so slack on showing affection one to the other, appreciation one to the other. And then the next one was, uh, my people are lacking in humility. And that's the truth. We got the biggest, the best, and the blessed. I tell you, there's competition until you're sick of it. It's time we recognize that the simplicity of the gospel does more good to save folks than the most powerful choir or singing, singing school. They're having a meeting someplace right now, and they're going to judge who's the best. Let me tell you what. We don't need to put best up, and we all worship God. We're going that direction so fast that it makes me feel scared for the next generation. But I'm going to take young people like you. I'd rather take you and live for God and get you stirred up to live for God. You'll be a testimony in years to come and days to come. Brother Willoughby he got killed years ago, but he, he was in my class at Bible college. And I tell you, he was a man that loved God. He prayed on his own. He, went, he had his own time to pray. He come to visit us and held a meeting for us. And, and my grandmother, my wife's mother she was a godly woman and she's thrilled when anybody loves to talk about Jesus and brother Willoughby go over to her house and talk with her they made a covenant I'm going to pray for you every day I'll pray for you you pray for me he had a happy time about him I never saw him with a downcast he had a smile we had a youth activity going on he come he enjoyed the youth activity you can enjoy a lot of things if you live right. You can enjoy the things that the church makes possible for you if you just live right. Now, I've had my disappointments. I'm working on my young people right now, and I got some that they're heading the wrong direction. I walked up to one girl that's raised in the church, and I said to her, I said, you are backslid right now. And I went on telling her about it. She stiffened. That's that nature inside of you. 
When she went home, she told her mother about it. She said, but, but I know Brother Price loves me. Yes, but that won't save you. Do you realize that God has a penalty for everything that he says that if you don't do it, this will happen? We get the idea that God's so loving, he permits anything go on that, that you want to happen. I'm telling you, I'm tired of the easy Christian. I want somebody that knows a living God strong enough to talk about it, feel after him, learn about him, feel the touch of God. One of the Psalms that thrills me continually is the 119th Psalm. It's the longest psalm in the scripture, but it talks about the word. Some of you fellows, would you get Psalm 119? Stand up and read one verse in Psalm, psalm 119 Psalm. I don't care where you read. I'm trying to show you. Go to the 119th Psalms and let him tell you how he feels about the word of God. You got it? Here, lady, you got your book, I'll read it. I want to show these young people something out of the out of the 119th Psalm. When you're discouraged, go to the 119th Psalm. Any one of them, get just let them read. Yeah, go ahead. Did you read them? Stand up, read. Speak up loud. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Now, the undefiled can walk in the what? The way of the Lord. The of the Lord. You got to keep yourself unspotted from this world. I want to read another one. Pat, anybody, read another one. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. He loved it so much, he bragged on it. Read another one. I'm not in a hurry. Stand up. Come on, son. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. His word was what made this world. He spoke the word, oh, and it was. Hallelujah. This earth was spoken by the word of God. My God. He exalted his word above his name. Yeah. His word gave him his name. If you follow that word and do what it says, I guarantee you're going to have a home in glory. Amen. It's the word. It's the word. It's not how many hours you prayed. It's how much of the Bible you're, you're obeying when you pray. Yeah. Young people. You've got to get your own schedule. You've got to get your own way. That'll suffice for now. I just want to give you a point or two to do work with this, if you will. And this is it. Take time to meditate on the word. That means think about it. Let it simmer in your thoughts. Now, you can read the Bible through. That's fine. But when, what I'm talking about is you take it personal. Just one verse may pop out to you. That verse is worth listening to. The psalm says ever so often, Selah, which means think about that. You need to stop and think and meditate with the word. I found that for me, when I wake up early in the morning, I don't get up in a hurry. I lay there to see if there's something that God can bring to my mind. I put my mind to let him put something in there to think about and meditate on. I tell you what, I've got my messages I've gotten answers. God supplied my needs for it. Let me give you one example of what I'm talking about. It, it'll work in your, on your jobs. It'll work any place. Years ago when I was contracting, I was building a house. I, I didn't realize it, but we was five feet over the setback line. I couldn't get them to make a variance. And I thought, what will that do? Because it was already framed. Paper and wire was on the outside, but it wasn't finished on the inside. And I got really concerned. I said, God, well, I don't know what to do with this. Before I went to sleep, I said, Jesus, please help me to find an answer for this thing. Next morning in my meditation, he impressed me. You was in Sacramento the other day, right by a pencil factory, and you saw some little logs about that big and about this long. He said, go there and get them. Take the bolts off of the plates, jack it up, and put these logs on every petition and just shove it over. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You're a builder. 
I did that. I made the living room bigger where the garage was. I cut off that chunk, put a garage in the back of the house, which is bigger. FHA gave me more money. And I said, thank you, Jesus. Now, you may think that's foolish, but I'm telling you what, when you put God in your work, he'll help you be brighter than what you are. I never gave a bid, but what I said, God, if this is going to be a headache to me, don't let me get it. And he helped me all the way through till I quit. I'm trying to get across to you. This works in your everyday living. God is a fountainhead of all wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. You can ask God for that. Young people, you can ask God for knowledge and understanding and wisdom. And God will show it to you. He'll reveal it to you. He'll put something inside of you, make you enjoy it, make you like it. It'll be different than just hoping for the best. But he won't study for you. You've got to study. I ask that God will bring up young people in these latter days that will have the same kind of commitment that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel. We need that kind of Christians in our churches today. We need it bad because we need to have the touch that God can use for the glory of his name. The Spirit of the Lord will be able to give us that. I want to read you a few scriptures here that's on humility. He said, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Please get that. Proverbs 22, he said, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. That's what he says. Serving the Lord, Paul said, with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Everywhere you read along the line of humility, you'll find out we should clothe ourselves with it. We should wrap ourselves in it to where we are not putting it on, but it's a natural outflow. Now, what is that? That's the nature of Jesus Christ. Peter said, by these precious promises, these precious promises. This is what's going to help you to be able to have it. He said, that is what's going to help you to be able to see and understand about his divine nature. It's this book. It's this word. I fall in love with this book more than ever before. Amen. Prayer won't substitute for the book. You're not going to be better by, by just spending so hours in prayer unless you go by the book. And God will hear your prayer. It don't have to be a long one. Most prayers in the Bible didn't last over three minutes. But when you ask God for something, you've lived it so that he can answer your prayer. Here's the purpose of humility. In Israel's day, the Lord said, I fed thee with, in the wilderness with manna, which by your fathers knew not, that, you might, that he might humble thee. That's the first thing he does to work with us, is to humble us. Let me tell you what, it's better, better if you humble yourself. Because when he hum, humbles you, you ain't got much left. You've got to understand, he gives us a chance. God, give me grace that I can be humble enough to make it right and do it right. and all of, That's the answer to it. What I'm crying for, give us some apostolics that live right when they leave the house of God. Amen. Church is not going to save you. Jesus is the only one that can save you. But we need to come for our fellowship in the house of God. That's fine. But I'm, I'm asking God, give us some young people grow up with a desire and a deep hunger and a deep thirsting that when they get grown and you want to use them, they can be ready to go for the glory of God. Everybody's complaining about our world and the conditions that we're here. And I live in one of the most liberal states in the Union. It's, it's a splattering of every nation in the world. And I want to make it known to you, God will build a church next door to hell and it'll be holy and godly and righteously no matter what the conditions are. Our governor, he was a black man for a while. Uh, he was governor and he said, we've had fires, we've had earthquakes, we've had, he mentioned all the disasters we've had in our state in the last two years back there at that time. He said, I think God's trying to talk to us. I said, Betty, I don't think you'd hear his voice if you tried. He's ungodly. He's wicked. But they had enough recognition that God maybe is in control. We've had this terrible thing come to the land. I'm sorry for what's happened. But almighty God controls the wind. 
And what he wants to knock down, he'll knock it down. You build it up, he'll knock it down again. You're not going to get, you're not going to get away with throwing your fist in the sky and cursing God. He'll outlive you, write your name on your tombstone. He does not back away from his word. Behold the goodness and severity of God. We don't like to hear the severity of God, but God is severe when he deals. It puts fear in your heart. It makes you want to walk upright and live godly. There is a, there is a need of understanding humility. I'm not sure if I could describe it. But it's the opposite of pride. Now, pride can be cloaked with a lot of church entity. Jealousy can get in your heart. Why don't they let me sing? I can sing better than she can. It's because you got jealousy. I had a young lady that wanted to take over the choir. I said, no, you're not the one. I know her and she knows I know her. I said, you got jealousy in your heart? I couldn't work with that. And to this very day, when she gets back to her old nature, she said, I see myself in my nature and said, I have to repent right then. That's how you got to conquer it. But what I'm trying to get across to you, if you have a humble attitude, you can work with anybody. You can do what's right. You got some character in you, some faithfulness in you that makes you be able to enjoy living for God. I'm in his courtroom. When somebody's done wrong to you, he's the, he's the head of this whole world. He's the one to call on. He said, I will take vengeance if you're in the right. They can't mistreat you without drawing the favor of God on your life. He will produce something to say, let you know he's saving you from that circumstance. You know, pride is a pride of possessions. You know what you do when you get proud of possessions? You talk about them. And sometimes more people talk about what they don't have. But I want you to know we can't ride over our pride, our nature, and expect to have a revival. We need a revival. What I'm trying to get across to us we don't live a pseudo Pentecostal way. If you're going to be, if, if it's wrong, it's still wrong. And if you live for God, you can't do it. I want people that has a love in their heart. This I want to do it. The lowest step in God's in God's work is when He gives you the requirements to be saved. You must be born again. You've got to repent. Baptized in Jesus' name. Filled with the Holy Ghost. That's a, you don't argue with that. But the next step is called duty. And duty is what you do to live for God. That's where you get the rules of the house. They give you your duties. But when you can make yourself love your duties, then it becomes a privilege. But the highest level of honor in God's house is the word delight. There's no rancor left over. There's no sad feeling about doing it, no complaining about doing it. I delight to do your will, oh God. That's what builds in your heart and makes you hungry and thirsty to reach to know your God. You can't do it by yourself. Now, God won't do it by himself either. He's got to have us to work with. He has you and me, and he'll work with us. The devil can't do anything either. He can only work with your carnal nature. He can't work with your spiritual nature. He works with your carnal nature. There is something special about what God does. He does not come running when you go to cry. And if you haven't been faithful, been done right, he does not overlook the thing. Sometimes we almost pray people through too, too fast. They, have, they don't know what they've done. But I tell you what, you must realize when you make it right with God, your heart, your mind, your soul knows that I did it right. And God's given me a touch of his spirit. And I'm going to walk with him and live for him in spite of everybody around me. I want to close with this. You can figure it out later. I tell young converts, when you come in the church and uh, you're converted, the first people you have to overcome is the church. 
I got enough carnal people that'll make you mad. And if you don't get mad, you, you're all right. This Russian lady came into our church. I had more problem with some of my saints. Yeah, they were mine. It wasn't God's, but what they did wasn't right. What I'm trying to get across to you, this girl had some principles, and she didn't even have the Holy Ghost at that time. But my families talked about her, mistreated her in ignoring her. And you know what? Pentecostal church has got a lot of cliques, and you young people want to go with certain ones that you got. I'm telling you what, you need to get with somebody you don't know in the church. I'm be friendly to them, but I'm trying to say. But I want you to hear what I'm saying. She didn't know what to do. She's learning the language and all of that. But the day came when she saw through this one lady. And she went to her and said, you know what? I've counted you as my sister. But I heard you criticize everybody in that church. I heard you talk about this one, that, and the other one. And I want you to know I'm not going to be your friend. I'm not going to be with you this close. And she talked about two hours to her. And I don't know what good she did to her, but at one point I'm trying to tell you, she had enough character just being a new convert to convict two of the saints in my church. What I'm trying to help is God give us something beyond our own efforts. In other words, if you can live it without God, then go ahead. But you can't live this without Jesus Christ in your heart, in your thoughts, in your mind. If I can get God to help you to do that, that's what I'm striving for. Several of the young people that I've got working on this, I'm not out just running to preach on schedules. I don't fool with schedules anymore. But I do get these young people together. I've got some that will come to my house and we'll talk and pray, young preachers and so on. But I tell you what, you get so bogged down taking care of a church as a pastor that you don't have much time for a lot of other things. But you've got to cut out some time and let God talk to your heart. I want somebody to come to me and touch them, t talk to me like a Dutch uncle. Make me fear, make me see the, my own weaknesses. If you think you're so good, he'll show you where you aren't. But that's all right if you get, I said, look, you got to save me. you got to help me. I may get mad, sad, or glad, but that's better than being lost. I don't want to be lost. I want to be saved. And God's got to help me. Let's stand and praise him together. We love you, Jesus. My soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander And hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur And hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when 
when I think that God, His Son not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in that on a cross my burdens gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art and when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and Proclaim, my God, how great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one. 